Hey guys, I know I normally do Star Wars stuff, but today I'm going to teach you how to play Rune Wars the Miniatures game. I'm still a little new at this, but I'm pretty sure I've got the basics down, so I apologize in advance if I get any minor mistakes, but uh, for the most part this is a good starting point. If you're interested in learning about Rune Wars, or you think you got it but you still have a few questions, hopefully I can answer them in this video, and if I leave anything out, be sure to mention it in the comments. Uh, so let's jump right in. So the first thing I want to talk about is what exactly Rune Wars is. Rune Wars is a one versus one points-based war game that uses miniatures. Uh, and what I mean by points-based is you're going to build your own army of 200 points. The standard game is 200 point armies. And uh, I will build a 200 point army and then we'll meet somewhere and we'll play uh, against another another army and who made the better army win. If you're wondering why we appear to be fighting in space right here, that is because my game mats are all Star Wars based game mats and I do not have a grassy game mat. So, uh, but besides what's cooler than, you know, horseback mounted cavalry or, you know, flying around in space. It's just, it's so trippy, but, uh, you can play on any three by six surface, or if you only have the corset, you can play on a three by three surface, or if you really want to, you can play on any surface you want, even a regular kitchen table. However, though standard games such as a league or a tournament level game would be done on a three by six at a 200 point limit. And so that means you can, every, every card, every unit in the game is going to have certain points. And so you'll add those up until you hit 200 points between units and upgrades. So one of the interesting things and one of the most unique things about this game is the components for specifically Rune Wars uses an interlocking base system. So uh, for example, this is one tile of units and they all come out and these are spearmen. And this, this keeps track of for one, what the unit looks like, whose army it belongs to, because I've painted mine, they come unpainted and uh, and also how many hit points this unit has. They, they interlock together to form one whole unit of four trays. One, two, three, four trays. As damage is done to this unit, I will begin to remove. You take, you know, they've lost one, they've lost another, and until so we lose a whole tray, and once the fourth one is gone, we remove the entire tray. And that is kind of how this game keeps track of its formations and your troops and how much damage a unit has taken. Uh, and as trays come off, units become less and less powerful. All right. Um, now, another thing that's particularly interesting is these dials. Every unit has a dial where you will dial up uh, your action and then your modifier. And the dials are actually really cool because um, there's all different types of actions you can take and they each have a color and that has to correspond to the modifier uh, has to be of the same color or the modifier can be white and modify anything. White is kind of like the wild color. So that part is pretty cool. Um, the, there are all kinds of different commands and I'm gonna go over all of those commands a little bit later, but uh, it's important to know that there's also a white number here that is initiative. So when we're activating units, uh, the initiative that you select will depend on the order that you, you're going to go. So we're going to start with ones. Uh, anybody have any ones? The player with initiative will do their ones for their first one first, then, then the other next player will do a one and go back and forth until you pass. And then you work your way two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine until uh, there are nothing left. And so in the core game, there actually are no ones in the base game. So you, you tend to just start at two, but I'm sure there will be ones in the future. So that's kind of how it works in the base set. Uh, for example, I might say, all right, I have a two and she's going to activate and she's going to do something. Do you have a two? You don't have a two. Do I have a three? I don't have a three. Oh, you have a three. And then your three goes. And so initiative going first is sometimes very good. Sometimes going late is very good. Since we're talking about components, I also want to talk about each unit's card. So in this case, I'm going to take a look at the Spearman's card. Now the Spearman on the, on the front side of their card is going to tell you everything about the Spearman. Uh, for one up here on the top is their armor. They have one armor and then they have one health. So that means the armor, basically damage has to meet or exceed this in order to go through and do a wound to this Spearman. So one and one is basically the lowest. That means every damage will get to a wound and one wound will kill a spearman. So if you rolled four damage, I would lose four spearmen and, well, and therefore a whole tray. If their armor was two and one, four damage, each one would only do one wound because it would take two damage to deal a wound. And uh, so basically how much damage it takes to deal a wound, how many wounds they can take. The cavalry, for example, have two and one. So it takes two damage to kill a horse, where it only takes one damage to kill a spearman. Uh, 
Additionally, down here it tells you what type of combat they can do. For them, it's only melee. Some units will also have melee and ranged, uh, and how many dice they roll. Sometimes they roll the same dice, sometimes they roll different. In this one, you, you roll a red and a blue die. There are three different colors of dice in this game. There are red, blue, and white dice, and I'll talk about those in, once we get to how combat works um, also, for melee attacks, when he's melee attacking, he can uh, spend two Surge, which is one of the symbols on the dice, to receive an Inspiration token. Uh, on the back side of the card, this talks about how they can be built. So you can't just put a, them together in any configuration of trays that you want. You have to follow the building platform here. So um, you can run this unit as only two trays, and uh, the cost here would be 18 points. Remember, we talked about a 200 point limit. If you ran this unit with four trays, it would be 30 points. So you're actually getting a discount the more trays you add, all right? And you're making a more, basically a higher hit point unit. However, you're still, even with nine, you're still only gonna roll those two dice. But another thing that's important is the more you add, the more upgrades you have. So like in other games, upgrades have their own symbols. So this, uh, if with only two trays, you can put an armor and a horn, and the more you gain, you gain oh, you gain a champion upgrade, and then you gain a, a, a flag or a banner upgrade. I don't remember what the names of all the upgrade types are called, but uh, basically you match the symbol to the card. So for example, here's an upgrade, uh, and this one has the symbol of a champion on it, and that matches this symbol uh, that's here in the third in the second row. So if we wanted to run this with spearmen, we would need to have at least a two by two, and that's kind of how upgrades work. Some of the upgrades will actually have uh, this is the same type. This is also a champion upgrade since that, but it has a symbol of a character. So this one actually puts a hero. Uh, in your uh, in your unit, and so this is carry carry race soccer. So what would happen is, and this is actually pretty cool. You would take one out of the front rank, and you would put her in the front rank there with the unit. Now this is pretty cool, especially with some of the special upgrades that come in some of the expansion packs. Like you can, if you have one that has like a, maybe a flag bearer, you can put him out there, uh, showing the colors and making your unit stand out a little bit more. And also, sometimes that one particular unit will have more uh, armor and health, so your, maybe your last surviving unit will be tougher to kill, or if they get an accuracy, then they can try to kill them earlier. But that's, uh, that's well, well, since we're talking about dice, let's talk about the dice. So, uh, your, your main dice that most of your units are gonna use are red and blue dice. So the red dice have uh, blank they have these are damages so we have damage symbols on there uh, this one here is called a panic and uh, we're gonna talk about that and uh, this one's called a surge and red dice don't have an accuracy so surge surge basically triggers abilities and panic uh, contributes to a panic test which we'll talk about uh, next um, let's do the rest of the dice so the blue die um, has more surges but low but less damage and also has an accuracy now this symbol here accuracy this means you can assign a wound to a figure anywhere in their tray uh, when you're able to assign wounds um, here's another one this one's just accuracy and now this one's accuracy and damage so basically for every accuracy you have you can assign one wound to somewhere in the front if you want or anywhere else and the reason that's important because normally when this unit is assigned to damage it has to come from the rear rank first uh, so you so that's why you generally put your heroes in the front so this way they're going to stay alive until the end but an accuracy could allow me to target my opponent's front rank unit especially if that's you know uh, somebody bearing a flag that gives the unit a big boost uh, then I can take out the flag bearer and deny the boost to the unit so accuracy can be very useful for that um, then there is the white die and I'm really I like this because it's a d12 uh, you don't see too many d12s in a lot of war games so uh, I, you know I, I am a big fan of this uh, out of all the FFG games I played I think this is the first one that's had a d12 the d12 has all kinds of interesting stuff there's one unique symbol on this one um, and that is the mortal strike and which has the skull on there and what this one does is it does a straight-up wound ignoring defense uh, now this is not as good as like in some cases it's not as good as getting a double damage because against infantry you would kill two whereas the mortal strike will only kill one but against a rune golem that has four armor that does a straight damage to him so so that's really good and some and some units can even get even higher armor if they boost their defense so uh, the the white die is definitely very good but uh, they're all good and the white die generally tends to come on heroes or certain upgrades that will allow that 
Now I did talk about a panic test, um, or so let's talk about, or actually the panic symbol. So that panic symbol looks like a little swirly. There are also panic tokens, because we're gonna talk about the different, um, here, let me pull this out here. We've got, we've got all kinds of different symbols uh, here, and these are basically your little buffs, boons and banes. So inspiration, this is a good one, everything else is bad. Um, so inspiration lets you, you can spend an inspiration when you activate a unit to ready one of their upgrade cards, because there are upgrade cards that you have to exhaust, and it makes it like you tap them. And they don't come back, they don't re-ready ever until you do something to ready them. And one way to do that is with an inspiration token. Uh, or you can spend an inspiration token to get rid of a Bane. And think of Banes as like debuffs or bad things, all right? Um, I'll talk about Panic last because that's going to take us somewhere else. But basically we have a Blight, and if you have a Blight on you when you're attacking, the opponent can spend a Blight token that's on you to make you roll one less die. Pretty, and then they can spend more if you have if you were going to roll two or three dice and you have two or three blight tokens on you they can spend them all and you almost completely negate your attack so that's important immobilize they can spend if you have an immobilized token they can spend it to cancel your movement when you reveal your dial uh, and if you have a stun they can spend it to cancel your uh, your modifier um, so and that's this on the other side here and so after I do the morale test I'm going to talk to you about all the different commands so, uh, panic. Panic is they can spend that when they're doing a panic test. So, if somebody rolls a panic symbol on a die, and let's say they also have a panic token on them, what will happen then is you'll do a, pan a morale test of two anytime you attack somebody. Once the attack is done, you'll do a, a morale test. And you do a morale test based on how many symbols. So, if they didn't have a panic token, you only rolled one uh, panic, you do a morale test. Now, basically, instead of a damage deck, you get this, um, this panic deck and uh, you're, you'll shuffle it and you'll flip over cards. And if they have one, you just flip over one card. Now this has two panic symbols on here. And basically to, to make this card work, think of these as like critical hits in other games. To make this card apply to that, you have to have the same number of uh, symbols. So this card only has two symbols, so we couldn't do what it says. But if we could, you would be able to make somebody turn around and run away from you. And that would be pretty cool. Um, and so there's different there's different types like this one has one symbol so with a panic test of one we could have made them do this this would make them discard all their boons generally there's three different types too here here's a three see this one's flee in terror this is going to make them run away and this is really bad and there's all kinds of different ones think of them just like critical hits but the more symbols the more severe they are so a uh so a panic test of three and the way we would do this is if if this unit had two um Let's say one of these. Let's say, let's say this unit had two panic tokens on them, and you attack them, and you rolled that. You could do a panic test of three, and I would take my damage deck. I'm sorry, my panic deck. Flip over the top three cards, and you would pick one. And you would have to have. If since I have three, you can pick anything you want, but it has to be one card. So you could pick this three. If I only had one, and you did a panic test of two. Uh, and you, would, you wouldn't be able to pick the three because you did a panic test of two. So the three would just be a waste. It wouldn't apply. So it's really nice to be able to do a panic test of three and do something nasty to the other unit. And these things range from, you know, uh, you remove a whole tray from the unit. Uh, some of the nastier ones are that way. Or make them run away and you get to choose where they run. That one's ter terribly bad because there are flanking bonuses with combat. And, and, and all kinds of nasty things. Um, let's talk about uh, the actions that you can do on your dial. And uh, so, so basically, we have a, we, you, you do get a reference card, but I'm gonna show you a dial here also. So the first one is March, and this is this symbol here. Now, the color actually doesn't matter. The colors can be you know all kinds of different things, although typically March is blue, but some units have different colored marches as well. Um, but, uh, but typically marches tend to be blue. And marches just to move, okay? Now all of the marches are gonna point forward, and unless it's modified, every march will be a forward march. So in this case, if you wanted a, an initiative seven, movement of four forward, you would, uh, you would select this, and you'd be able to go four forward uh, at initiative seven, so pretty late in the turn. And that's good in case there's maybe archers out there and you don't wanna go forward too early and then get attacked. But then you also have a modifier over here. And since you did a blue, um, a blue action, you can select a blue modifier. Or you can select a white modifier because white goes with everything. So if you select the uh, white modifier after you do your four forward, you'd have a plus one defense. That's what that modifier does. But if you're moving, you can select the turn 
right? So you're going to do a slight turn and this will minus one. So you do one less range. All right. So you, instead of doing a four, you'll do a three and it can go left or right. But the turn here means you can choose when you do it. So that's actually gives you some reaction. Um, and now there's also a modifier here that says that looks like this. It has a little, a little impact symbol on the edge and that's called a charge. And that's good if you're going to, let's say, since we're doing the horses one, if I were going to attack these archers here and I moved and poof, I hit them, well now I, I, I line up, we square up with them and I can attack them. Since I hit them with a charge, I can attack them. Uh, so I get to do, you know, I get to move and attack. And that's a very good thing because there's penalties for charging and missing. So if I charged, but I didn't quite make it, my unit gets a panic token. Or if I moved and it wasn't a charge, like let's say I just did the regular modifier. Uh, if I if I hit them and I was in a charge, I, then I get a panic token and I don't get to attack. So you want to make sure you know you, you're timing your charges correctly and anticipating where your opponent's going to be. Uh, I also have a, a a two here, which is another forward move too. And this is actually a bonus action. It's not necessarily modifying my move. It's giving me a whole another move. So I could do a, a four forward and then another two forward. The cavalry, this is the cavalry's dial, by the way, and they're very, very fast. And you can tell what the dial is by what's on the front. This is the side you reveal to your opponent. And so when I set their dials, I'll, I'll put, I'll, if, they're, if they're right here on the map, I'll set the dial behind them to indicate that they're ready to go. You can also set them on the card if you want. So let's see what else we've got here. Um, this symbol here is a special, and and it's uh, and it's basically it, it, it'll activate something on your upgrade cards or on your card itself, uh, and it's different for every unit. Uh, and there, even if some units don't have a special, they can still trigger a special on their dial because uh, there are upgrades that have specials. So you might put like some kind of magic spell on a unit that lets them shoot a fireball at somebody, and to shoot that fireball, you have to trigger your special. Uh, so that is movement, um, and now we have shift. Shift is, well, these guys don't have shift, so let me find the spearman. Uh, shift looks like this. It looks kind of like a compass pointing uh, north, south, east, and west. And shift has uh, a little number next to it too, so they have shift of one. Most people who have a shift have to do a shift of one. And basically that lets you move forward or backward or uh, or left or right. And uh, you know, you can yes, you can move backward in this game. And basically you're gonna, it just uses movement templates very similar to X-Wing or Attack Wing. And uh, you're gonna line the black part up here with the front of the base and, and then just slide them forward until it lines up. And that's kind of how a movement works. And just the shift lets you do it in any direction. Um, it's still movement, but it's, uh, it's a different color and it can also pair up with different colored modifiers. So maybe I want to shift and get a green plus one defense. Um, that's that one. Reform, this one looks a little bit like a chessboard. Okay. And, 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 and when I first started playing this game, I would get shift and uh, reform confused because they are similar in appearance. Uh, but reform basically just lets you spin. So you have to spin around the center point, but if you want to just turn around or whatever, now you can't, you can't go into something. So if I had another unit right here, I couldn't spin this way and be overlapping them. Uh, but you can, uh, you, if for some reason you just, you can't turn any which way, you can always pick the, pick the whole unit up and turn it around backwards if you need to. But yes, yeah, shift just lets you spin. And since so much of the movement is forward based and there are gonna be obstacles on the table, uh, shift is actually very important for making sure you can uh, you can go. There are also some units like this Rune Golem here uh, who can't turn at all. So the only way, he just, he's like almost like a rook in chess. He can kind of only march forward. So the only way you're gonna get him to go anywhere other than straight is by eventually shifting him. Get him forward where you need him to go, then shift him and then move him some more. So that's pretty interesting. Um, now we have melee attack. So melee attack looks like sim, uh, swords, right? Now if you'll notice, I have two different colors of melee attack. What's the difference between the colors? Nothing other than what uh, modifiers they can line up with. So if you'll notice the cab, right, are my horse lords here, uh, they have a red modifier of, of a damage. And basically that's just adding one damage to whatever I roll for attack. So if I rolled three damage, this would make it four damage. So that's great. And that's very good because uh, there's things like threat that can actually multiply our damage. So having one extra damage is huge. Um, but if I go with the, the yellow attack, I won't get that damage because it's not a yellow damage, right? Now, why would I want to go with the yellow attack? Who knows? Who's been paying attention? This is the quiz part. Well, it's this little white number here, the initiative. If I wanted to attack early in the round, the benefit for attacking so quickly is that I don't get the extra damage. 
But if I want to attack later in the round, if I'm going to be patient and hopefully I don't get killed before I get a chance to attack, I can go with the initiative seven attack and then my patience is rewarded with an extra damage. Okay. Now, like again, I've said this before, white goes with anything. So if I wanted to do the three attack, I could queue up the white plus one damage and make sure you always have to make sure they're aligned to this little top arrow that's in white here at the top. All the, uh, all the dials have those. So uh, that's melee attack. Now, a ranged attack is, uh, all right, let me find a ranged attack. Let's see, who's got a ranged? Carrie has a ranged. Oh, this is my hero here, Carrie Wraithstalker. She has a ranged attack, and it's this symbol right here. It looks like a spearhead or an arrowhead. And uh, Carrie's, she's, see, she's a hero. She has very low initiative. She can attack at initiative two. And for her, it's green, so she can get a plus one, um, a plus one armor. So she'll have one higher defense. And this is nice because basically once you lay this down, especially so early in the round, the whole rest of that round, once this dial has been revealed, she has that plus one. If she gets attacked before she can lay this down, she won't have the plus one for that attack. This has to be showing for her to get the plus one defense, which is kind of cool. Um, so a ranged attack works just like a melee attack, except you're going to use a range ruler here. And the range ruler, let's see if I can lay this out and I'll kind of show you here. I've got my undead over here, that Wayquar. Uh, we'll just measure, and, and and the thing is, there's really, by default, there's no uh, bonus for attacking somebody close or far away. They just have to be from one to five. Range attacks just mean it has to be within range. Some just out of that range means, oh, don't have it. Don't have range. But there also are little lines here in the front, and the quick way to do it is you can just put this here, and then that's a general way to do it. Um, but the, the more precise way is to lay it on its side because if, you'll, if you can see right here, you see these little lines, that's kind of what shows you arc from this character. And it has to touch from her front base within arc and be in range. You also have to have line of sight. So if Carrie here wanted to attack these archers that are right in front of her, but she was behind the cavalry, she would not have line of sight on them because every line from her front to them goes through another unit. Now, if it was only partially obstructed, she would still have line of sight. But if it was fully obstructed, she wouldn't have line of sight. So line of sight is important here, and especially with these large trays that can get much and much larger, it's very, very possible to completely obstruct line of sight if you put your archers on the back. And that's one of the strategies that goes into this game, is you do kind of want your archers to be in the back because another limiting factor of ranged combat, you cannot perform a ranged combat attack if you are engaged with somebody. So if somebody, if these knights, if these archers were gonna shoot their arrows, but my knights went first and collided with them and charged and did the combat with them, well, when, once the archer's uh, ranged combat dial gets revealed, it's negated and it gets just canceled. So that's there's some penalties for planning incorrectly in this game. So that is definitely a thing. Um, all right, we have some other actions. Uh, let, let's talk about rally. Now, Rally, here's my knights again. I'm going to use their dial. Rally looks like a drum. Now, this is a very um, powerful ability because what this does, this gets rid of all of your banes. Uh, so all of the debuff tokens that we talked about before, it'll clear all of them off of you. It will also ready all of your upgrade cards. Now, remember I said before, an inspiration could ready a single upgrade card or get rid of a single bane. This is like a super inspiration, all right? Uh, similar to Armada in a way of doing a command on the command dial as opposed to how a token is weaker. Think of an inspiration as a token, whereas this is the, you know, the, uh, the mother of all tokens. So this does everything. If you don't have any banes and you don't have any upgrades that need to be exhausted uh, or need to be refreshed, then this still has a use because this will give you an inspiration token. So this is better of a choice when you have stuff on you or you have a couple of things you need uh, or you know, upgrades you need to be refreshed but this is also good to give you an inspiration token. So sometimes people will do this first turn, so they start the game with an inspiration token that they can spend later on a subsequent turn. So rally is good. Some units actually have rally as a bonus action. So like Carrie Wraithstalker here, she has a white rally as a bonus action. So she can do this anytime, anywhere, which is really nice. Uh, you know, as long as she doesn't somehow lose her bonus action. Um, but that's pretty cool. And so we already talked about the skill, which is the last action on our bonus card. And, uh, and that's just this one here again, uh, to trigger something that you're either your unit card might have or something that would be on an upgrade card. So now I want to talk about how we move and as far, specifically how we 
collide and engage and square up with other units. So I'm going to use these archers a couple of times, uh, and I've got—I mean, I've got other Wakewar units that are out here. I've got our our golem or our, our carrion rider and our golem. Let's say they're fighting or whatever. Now, so, but I'm going to use the cavalry here to give you the example, and they're going to charge these archers. Now it's important when you're building your units that they all have to be facing the front way. Uh, it's easier with like things like spearmen here because they have spears that are always going to be pointed straight. Uh, you can't like have your spearmen pointed diagonally because it has to be clear what is the front and what is the sides. So uh, my archers, this is their front edge. And the edges are important because your front edge gives you something called threat. So because there are two trays in their front edge, when they attack me, they multiply their damage by their threat. Everybody does this. Every unit in the game multiplies damage by threat. So if they were to roll um, two hits, all right, two hits. If they rolled two hits, that would be four damage. And because my knights have two armor each, that would kill two knights and eliminate a whole tray. And that's pretty important. And when a whole tray is eliminated, the tray gets picked up. And that's also pretty good because now my threat is lower because now my front edge is only one tray so I don't get any bonus to damage dice rolled. It's really nice when you can have two trays. Some units can go even beyond two trays like the spearmen can run three by three. I can have a, so like a, a giant, they call it a death star of, uh, of spearmen and then I'm multiplying everything by three uh, and then there is all kinds of ways to increase threat. Some characters have a special ability that just increases their threat naturally and those are also nice too because it's still a multiplier. Since I'm talking about threat, the spearmen have a second rank. Every every rank you have of trays beyond the first, if it's full, gives you a full re-roll. So think of Yahtzee, right? I, I roll these dice. Oh, I, I don't like either of them. I have a full re-roll. I can roll any number of dice again. If I had a partial rank, I can roll one die again, which is usually still pretty good. In this case, it was great. That gives me three damage. So times my threat of two, that would be six damage, and that's an awful lot. Now, if I had... In this case, let's say I had two more rows of spearmen. I'm going to pretend these horses are spearmen for just a moment. So if I had a unit like this, this would be two in the front, three rows deep. This would give me a full reroll. This would give me a full reroll, and and so I could if I could if I didn't like everything, I could reroll everything again. I have a full reroll again. I can reroll everything again. Or you don't have to reroll everything, but you can pick. Um, so if I have a partial and a full, then I get a full reroll and a one die reroll. And I can do those in either order, but uh, you know, having multiple ranks deep gives you lots of rerolls. So more consistent damage. But uh, it's definitely more flashy to have a, a full front end of, uh, of guys. Also having ranks deep gives you more health and more hit points, so you're less likely to lose units from the front. So that's also important. All right, so now that I've talked about your threat and then your ranks deep to be able to reroll, let's talk about movement. So I'm going to say that these guys were charging three and uh, I will take this maneuver template and I'll line it up to the front edge of these cavalry and we're going to move. And I'm going to move along here until I collide. And once I figure a point where I collide, which is right here, all right, and I'm going to zoom in and try to uh, show you this a little bit more clearly. So the idea is I'm moving this way for the sake of demonstration and I'll collide right here. So what, what this means is I've collided on a corner. Now normally if you collide, you would, you would square up against somebody. Uh, like if I had a collision right here, I would square off against them. What that means is we make sure our bases are flush. So even if I was at an angle, I'm going to straighten out and align to one of the edges that I'm touching. So if I hit right here, I could align this way or this way, and, and, and I have my choice as long as I'm touching uh, where, I, where I touched. I couldn't go all the way over to this side, but I could have the choice of going straight on or there if it was in between, all right? But if I collide on a side or on a corner, now if I collide on a side, I'll be flanking. So if I hit them from the side, I'm flanking, and what's great about that is I get a bonus red or blue die when I'm attacking. So if I think they normally roll, what are they? cavalry normally roll two red and a blue. So they normally roll two red and one blue die. So I can add another red or another blue and then roll and then get a ton of damage and maybe maybe just kill the whole unit all at once. But the interesting thing is if I collide on the corner, 
How, which side do we square up on? Well, uh, we'll use this handy dandy range ruler and line it up to the corner as best we can overhead. And what we do is we look for how many trays do I have on the left side of the range ruler or on the, and on the right side of the range ruler. Whichever side I have more trays on, that's the side I square up on. Now, if it's right in the middle or if it's only one tray, then, I, then the attacker gets to choose. Uh, or whoever's moving gets to choose. But in this case, I have more on this side, so I would align this way. So, so that's flanking. Flanking's important. Uh, now you can still, they can still attack me back if they do a melee. Remember that I said you can't range it when you're locked up and engaged with somebody else. But what you can do is uh, you can melee. Now, now their front edge though, because their, their front edge is, is right here is two. But now since they're engaged with me, they treat the front edge as the side that's engaged. So they would actually only get uh, their one modifier. And that's, uh, or their one threat. So they wouldn't get double damage when they attack me back. That's pretty important because, uh, you know, they really want to have that double damage and most units do. Now against a unit that's maybe four by four, or sorry, two by two, uh, it would be the same because their, their front edge would still have two, two ranks in the front. So they would still roll and double their damage. But because I'm flanking them, even though they have a, a, another row deep, they wouldn't be able to get a reroll on me. Now, if I attack them from their front, uh, they would be able to do all the full the full stuff, um, and if I attack them from the rear, their front edge or their touching edge to me would still be their front edge. So they still double the damage, but they wouldn't get. It's still considered flanking, and they would not get uh, any re rolls from that. Now, if you're engaged, what can you do? Well, I'll tell you what you can't do. You cannot move. So any move or charge. Let's say these two units were going to charge each other. Whoever went first would charge and then attack the other one. The other, then the next one, if they reveal a charge, it's discarded, doesn't count. You cannot move when you're engaged. So that's why another reason initiative is important, but they could queue up a melee attack and then just attack. Or if they are anticipating a charge, they might queue up a melee attack at a higher initiative like seven. Oh, you're gonna charge me. I think you're gonna charge me. So I'll attack at seven so I can attack you back. Um, but then some, uh, there's been cases where both people expect the other one to charge and they both queue up a melee attack, but they couldn't melee. One of the things, the only way you can get away from being engaged is with a shift. Remember this one here, shift? And you can only shift directly away from who you're engaged with. So we would do, we would do a move to the rear to disengage. Well, now we're not engaged anymore, but breaking away from an engagement gives you a panic token. Remember these panic tokens, they, st they stay and so they're spent with a, doing a panic test and they can cause all kinds of nasty things. So if you're getting panic tokens, you may wanna plan on doing a rally fairly soon to try to purge your panic tokens before they attack you and spend your panic tokens and are able to cause all kinds of havoc to you. So at the start of a game, one of the things you're gonna do is you're gonna take a look at how many points each player brought to the battlefield. If uh, whoever has less points will get to be the player with initiative and they're going to be able to choose from some things. So first off, you're going to deal out three battlefields and the battlefields are all kinds of different ways to set up. All right. And this is represents a six by three play area. And like this battlefield means that you can, you can deploy all the way out to range five, but your opponent can only deploy to range one. So basically everything that they put out has to be touching the rear, whereas you can be way more tactical. All right. And this also shows what type of obstacles we're going to deal. Um, up here on the top and then there's one called head to head and and there's all kinds of different ones like this one's pretty interesting this one's called careful approach and you you know this is your setup area and this is my and you and when you and you can pick which one whoever has the initiative can pick which one or if they don't want to pick a battlefield they can also pick one of the objectives because you're going to deal three battlefields and three objectives and the objectives are going to have some kind of victory points and they're going to tell you some things that you might need to do like like this one escort is actually a little bit like football where you have some one where you'll pick one of your units and they get to be like a running back trying to score a touchdown and you put a, a token in the opponent's deployment zone because it is almost like an end zone. So you're, uh, you know, you're in, and one player is just trying to stop the other person from getting there or kill them. And there and there's all kinds of different objectives that kind of change the game a little bit. So as first player, you can choose. Uh, you know, there'll be three of these out and you can choose the either the, the objective or the battlefield and the, the other player gets to choose the other one and then 
based on what uh, what types of what battlefield it is there you can also deal out cards for the terrain and that will tell you different terrains that you're going to use you're going to use three terrain in every uh you know and everything in every game and so they th range from things like forests or or you know smaller different things like, oh, like well there's a little swamp there and we got a rocky outcropping or a spike trap this one will do damage to you if you if you hit it and and and, and you units can actually go inside terrain too so if you do a move that overlaps terrain if there's nobody in there you can go inside of it as long as it uh, it can support the number of units and different terrain cards they'll say like the crumbling wall here this can hold two two people in it um and and then so there's different ones that can hold different amounts of people the forest can hold six and and they can go in there and they get different benefits uh and that's a little bit more advanced as too far as like the benefits that they get but um you know sometimes it's nice to hide somebody because they get like some defensive they get extra bonus against melee or some some of them give extra bonus against ranged attacks so it's nice to have somebody hide in there but it also treats your entire front edge um, as is it the outside of the obstacle so if you're if you have a ranged attack and you can go in there you kind of can get shoot from anywhere so you you can have your archers kind of hide in the trees so that's kind of nice and then the next thing you're going to do uh, once you get ready to start the game is you have an initiative token. And the initiative token is also a round counter. And it's, this, it's kind of a standard FFG piece of uh, machinery here, right? You've got a, a round counter and it's got eight rounds. This game will only take eight turns and then you count up victory points. Uh, and you can you, you pass this back and forth. So if I'm first player or the player with initiative, I'll have it at one. Once we're done, I'll hand it to the other opponent. Then they'll be the first player for turn two and they'll hand it back to me back and forth. You also toss the runes. And now these are, there are five runes and they have different symbols on them and you're gonna to toss them kind of randomly and they change different things that are going to happen in the game. There are certain units that are more magical units and they are going to be affected by different types of symbols on these runes. Now the runes have, there's three different colors and there's, oh and then they actually have names too. So these red runes, uh, or the triangles, they are called unstable and uh, unstable energy. And there's either going to be two of them on a symbol or nothing, okay, or no or none of them. Uh, there's a stable energy, which is the blue one. And the funny thing about this blue one, it's called stable energy, is there's a blue on each side. So every round you're guaranteed to have at least one blue. Sometimes you'll have a second blue. And then on the other, on the, on the other ones are natural energy, and those are the green symbols. And uh, and so one of the things in the in the core set, your rune golem for the Dakon, uh, he gets extra movement based on the red runes, and he gets uh, extra threat based on the blue runes. So he's more power. He hits as hard as the blue runes, and he moves as fast as the red runes. And so you're going to toss these runes before you do your dials. So if there's a lot, if you have four red runes showing, that might say, oh, well, I want my rune golem to move this turn because he's going to be able to move really fast. Now the green runes, the natural runes, are very nice for the uh, for the reanimates, who are the, basically the skeleton infantry for the for the Waykwar, because they can actually regenerate if they've lost a couple of skeletons, but they but the tray is still on the board, they can regenerate skeletons in their trays based on how many green runes. Are showing so in this case there's two green runes so they could regenerate two so they get hit points back basically and that's pretty nice for them and then there's as more expansions come out they're going to reference the runes in all kinds of different ways but you toss these each turn and so while my rune golem might be really strong if i've got two blue run blue, two blue runes showing this one turn next turn i might only have one blue rune and he might not be as strong so it has a little bit of randomness a little bit of the nature of fluctuating magic but you're going to do that every turn and that uh changes the game up a little bit and that can also depending on you know how you want to play if you kind of prefer the randomness you can build more magical units or you can build units that don't affect you know that don't care about the runes at all so it, you know as more and more expansions come out you're going to have those type of um, you know the abilities like i want to you know consistency over the random spurt of high damage and that's kind of just a quick rundown of, of, of how the game works. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope you uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. If you haven't already, check out my unboxing video if you wanted to see what the what the pieces look like as they come straight out of the box. Uh, I've been playing this game a little bit more. I have some battle reports also on my channel. So if you wanted to uh, watch those, I'll put some links up. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching. I, I, if I got anything wrong, 
I apologize. I'm I'm still in the uh, still very much in the learning phase of this game. It hasn't been out for too long, and I have only been playing it for a few weeks now. But I think I covered all the basics. Uh, if I missed anything. Feel free to let me know, and uh, you know if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, and I'll try do my best to answer them. So that's about it, guys. One thing I did forget to mention is how you win. So at the end of the uh, eighth round, if you haven't completely destroyed all of your opponent's units, you're actually going to add up how many points are left on the table. Uh, and so that's kind of how you determine the winner. So whoever has basically the most stuff. There are specific rules on what constitutes points and upgrades and, and all of that. And also objectives give you points as well. But that's basically how you win. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe and because uh, you can win a Ray Speeder Funko Pop I'm giving away. This was a Star Wars Celebration exclusive. Uh, and all you need to do to enter that is to subscribe and leave a comment on one of my videos. Uh, when I hit 8,000 subscribers, I'll be giving this thing away. And uh, make sure you hit alerts to find out if you're going to be a winner because I'll be posting those in a video and you don't want to miss that. Um, also, if you uh, like this video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, share it with your friends that may be looking to get into Rune Wars. And hopefully I didn't screw up too badly. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.